This episode is proudly sponsored by DMC Insurance. From Transport Topics in Washington, D.C., this is Road Signs. And now here's your host, Michael Fries. Thank you for listening to Road Signs, the podcast series from Transport Topics that explores the trends and technologies that are shaping the future of trucking. And thank you for joining us on this very special Veterans Day episode, where we'll share the stories of our U.S. veterans. It's not hard to argue that the military has become a conduit for a career in trucking. Former service members are often sought after by fleets, and some are running their own trucking companies. So for this episode, we'll ask the question, how has their military experience shaped their impact on the trucking industry? Later in the program, we'll speak to those experiences with Army veteran John Baxter, who served in Vietnam as a technician in the equipment supply line known as the Red Ball Express. But first, we want to welcome another Army veteran who served in Afghanistan, James Rogers, owner of Spartan Direct, a trucking company based out of Peavely, Missouri. Welcome to the show, James, and thank you for your service. Oh, thank you for having me. No, not a problem. I'm really excited to have this episode. This is something that uh, that I personally wanted to do uh, for for quite some time, and and, and today being uh, Veterans Day, like I said, I'm very excited. <laughs> so let's get into it. Um, b- before we go into you know uh, Spartan Direct and just the trucking industry in general, I would like to ask you. What made you join the military? Well, it was, it was, it was around around the time of nine eleven, and I was actually driving a truck at the time. And it made the the initial thought that went through my head was, what is what am I doing? You know, I, I felt like I was meant for something bigger than myself. I always felt like that's where I was at in my life at the point in time. So I literally drove a truck and a flatbed into a parking lot of a strip mall and walked directly into the recruiter station. And, and that's, you know, that's kind of where it started my journey back in, you know, October of 2003. And it, um, that was the initial thought, you know, I always felt like I was meant for something bigger. And, and to me, especially now after, you know, serving as long as I did, um, and where I'm at now in my life is that, you know, military service to, to me is, you know, the biggest thing you can do outside of yourself. Uh, it's, it's, it's a journey that basically everybody that understands it, that has any time in or has served or currently serving, it's, you know, you write the biggest check that, can, that will hopefully never, ever be cashed, but you're willing to allow it to be cashed if need be. And that's, that's where I'm at. That I, I, I like that. I like that statement a lot. Um, I, I know um, personally as for myself as a Navy veteran, um, I was I was told when I went to boot camp that the the, the U.S. Navy and I'm sure the, the Army has I'm pretty sure you heard something maybe similar to this when when you were going through um, boot camp is uh, you know that you know that the U.S. Navy will you know break you down and then at the end will rebuild you up and then some and and that's kind of how I was was uh, drawn toward the military as well you know there's something bigger than myself out there and you know you needed that um, particular environment to, to, to flourish, you know, to the person who you are now. So, um, you know, one of the things, um, just, just reading about your story, James, that, that really intrigued me, I think just as being a former military, I, I thought was very interesting was when you joined the army, you had joined at age 27, which, you know, as you, as you know, you know, at, that's that's an old man when it comes to most enlistees. It when, is when, when, when they come to when they come to the military. Um, so uh, it just 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 having that you know life experience. Um, you know, and you said you wanted to go toward something else. That's a, a a pretty bold move. What was your what was your MOS during your time in the, in, in the army? When I and, and you're right, going in at 27, uh, definitely that's an old man's age in the military. You know. Most of these guys are coming in at 17, 18 years old, you know, and you're 10 years or senior. So that was a journey in itself, just trying to prove myself physically. Uh, but my job, when I went, when I first enlisted, it was a 14 Juliet, which when the rec- you know how recruiters are, they, they hype up any job that they're trying to fill going in the military, you know? So I was told, oh, you're going to go in and you're going to shoot missiles and you're going to do all this other stuff. But when I started training after basic training, the job basically entailed is I'm a two man crew that's operating a Sentinel radar system out in the middle of nowhere by myself for, for the guys that would, you know, at the time shoot stinger missiles or Bradley linebacker, you know, the assault vehicles, or we would relay information to uh, Patriot missile batteries for, you know, incoming aircraft that were, you know, getting 
getting under their radar, we would pick it up, which, you know, and anybody will tell you who's in air defense. And I'm sure you've heard it too. Is air defense is the dog and pony show of the army. It's not very seldom used, but when it's needed, you know, they're okay. They're there. Well, I, I just want to say, um, you know, to the listeners, I, I had said MOS and that stands for a military occupational specialty. So just kind of the job that you do in the military, just for anybody that was, because uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll apologize when, when two military guys are talking. There's going to be a lot of acronyms thrown out. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, I did. I did that job for that was during my first term. Um, when I came up on my, I was in Fort Hood, Texas. We'd uh, I'd actually gone from basic training out of out of Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I went to Fort Hood, or yeah, no, Fort Bliss. Went to Fort Bliss. Was at Fort Bliss. Then I got sent to Korea. Did my rotation in Korea, came back to Fort Bliss, and then our whole unit got transitioned to Hood. And then when I got to Fort Hood, I came up on my reenlistment, and I was like, you know, there's, I'm still missing something. This isn't quite for me. You know, I was, I'm, I was more high energy. I was always a go getter, always wanting to succeed. And, you know, go above and beyond. So I actually went through reclassification. And uh, at that point in time, that's when I, and this is going to sound weird, I reclassified, here comes another acronym, to CBRNE at the time, uh, which was a 74 Delta, and now it's CBRN, which is Chemical, Biological, Radiological, Nuclear Warfare, and at the time, Explosives, which everybody says, well, what is that? <laughs> I'm like, well, I, I defend against everything that you can't smell, you can't see, but could kill you before you could even smell it or see it. And also, you know, our instructors and everybody, what I know now, you know, and especially with going with the experience was basically you're an infantryman with a, with a specialty as a chemical guy. So, and that's where, I, that's where I'll, I'll kind of stop there. And it, it just, it's a great experience. Oh yeah. I, I mean, I bet it was a very unique one. Um, you know, it took you to a lot of places, this career, you, you know, he, as you just mentioned, um, but you also uh, served in Afghanistan, correct? Yes, I did. I sure uh, did. Yeah, what was that experience like? Eye opening. Mm-hmm, Eye opening on so many different levels. The first part of it was one, how quickly my job can transition and how quickly senior leadership can spot a talent in an individual and how that talent is used, not necessarily what your job may be used, but your talent. Also, it was eye opening to the camaraderie that is built between individuals when you're put in that kind of a situation. And then it's also eye opening to how, for me personally, you know, the make sure I find, use the right word here. I guess you could say the empathy that is developed when you see people of those countries. Um, it's, it, it was a, it was, Every time I would, went back, it was a life changing experience. Yeah, I, mean, I, I can imagine. I mean, I, I know just you know being overseas, and you were mentioning you were in Korea. You know, uh, I and then I know just from going on deployment. And one of the things that my officers would tell me, especially when going going into a different country, is to remember that this is not the U.S. So you're you know you are a guest in this country. I mean, in, in whatever capacity and, you know, in, in Korea, it's one thing. I mean, it's, you know, you, you went there, it, it's a peaceful region. Uh, and now you're in Afghanistan, very hostile. Very. You know, so, you know, that, and that I'm pretty sure they gave you a, a, a different perspective. Oh yeah. I mean, definitely, definitely. When the hostile is not even the right word, the briefing, you know, and um, the briefing we were, at, you know, this word, we were given a briefing, obviously, you know, they called them OPSEC briefings, which means operational security before we left. And then obviously we got one when we landed because situations were always changing. So, but to kind of segue to what I was saying was about job changing, you know, talent was one of my talents was I was really, really good with firearms. I was raised around firearms, you know, long distance shooting, short distance, all that stuff. And we had a Sergeant Major that, you know, realized that I was good at that job. So he picked me as a, at the time I was a staff Sergeant and he picked me to basically be a platoon leader or a platoon sergeant for 30 other soldiers. And our job was, you know, mission convoy support. We were uh, QRF, quick reactionary force. We were, you know, uh, what they called high value uh, security details, stuff like that. And when the briefing that we received was straight from a general to the colonel, you know, the brigade commander, and then through uh, down to the battalion commander, directly from those three, the top three. And, and the, the briefing we got was do not trust anybody, including the interpreters. And, and, and it wasn't so much what he said, but how he said it, the tone 
that was set was the fact of this is bad, you know, and, and he was, and that was kind of the way that you had to approach everything. I mean, it's, it's a reality, no matter the bonds that you would develop with the locals, you know, because you are, you are a guest in their country and you do feel empathy for things that you see and you experience, but you had to keep it in the back of your mind. I can't trust this guy because he very well, you know, could carry an explosive device. You know, you, you, you don't know you're working very closely with them, with the local, you know, locals. Um, you're working closely with local interpreters. You're working closely with local workers that are hired to, you know, to, to that build, be, build better kind of deal. And you just never knew. So that's why, you know, you're always on edge and it's a hard switch to turn off. In times like these, it's crucial to stay informed. Transport Topics is offering all the information you need to make business decisions in these unprecedented times. And in the wake of the many event cancellations and group gatherings, TT ensures a virtual way to consume business content and conversation. To join the conversation and stay ahead of the news, follow Transport Topics on all social outlets or by visiting ttn.ws forward slash stay informed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, my time in the military, I mean, the most intense time that, that I spent in the military was just um, escorting oil tankers across the Persian Gulf. I mean, that was, I mean, that, that, I mean, that was a pretty intense time. I mean, uh, thank God it was short, but it, but it was, it was intense all the same. You know, but as I mean, I, I want to, uh, you know, just get back to, uh, you know, what you were doing in Afghanistan. I mean, you know, you, you, you served for, you served for a while. Um, you, you had, a, you know, a, a back injury while, uh, you know, while, while you were in Afghanistan and you were um, you know, honorably discharged a, a, after that. C- could you talk about the time just, I mean, just being out of the military and the experiences that you, that you had just described? Um, and, and, and just sort of the transitioning back to trucking, you, you said that you were trucking before the service. Um, can you talk about that, that transition, just kind of the highs and lows of that, and then how, uh, your life experience, uh, you, you know, forged a way for you to become the, the owner of a truck company, trucking company that you are now. Yeah. Um, well, the, I was driving before I started and I really didn't understand the importance of the trucking industry, of the industry as a whole. I, I, before now and before my military service, I, I looked at trucking as just a job. You know, it was just a way to make a living, to, to do, you know, to live. And then after my military service, the, you know, the transition coming from the military to where I was three years ago was difficult, extremely, extremely difficult. Um, I went through a very, very hard period of mental, mental anguish, I guess you could say, you know, fighting, fighting those demons. You know, you you hear that quite often. You know, I was was fighting those demons uh, and I became a statistic. Um, I got hopped up on, you know, prescription pain medications, a lot of them. Uh, I allowed, I allowed myself to fall into that cat, you know, statistical category. I did Um, the, whatever the doctors were prescribing me, I was taking you know, I was taking 90 day prescriptions in less than weeks, like two, three weeks. And then I learned the trick of if I went to a civilian doctor, uh, all I'd have to say is, you know, basically I'm a veteran. I was, I'm injured. I'm in pain. And obviously they would give it whatever I wanted. Uh, and I hit rock bottom. I hit rock bottom about three years, um, after that. And if it hadn't have been for my wife walking into our bathroom, um, at that point in time, I had a 40 caliber pistol in my hand. Um, and, and, and she, she was, she talked me off the ledge, you know, she was that rock and still is to this day and, um, getting the help I needed to and stuff like that. I, 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 that's when I realized that what was missing in my life was that need to fulfill a duty doing something once again, bigger than myself. And what you were talking about before and fulfilling that duty was, was, you know, being a truck driver and being in yes. that industry was, okay. Yes. And, and that's where I, 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 that's where I gravitated back towards the trucking industry. Um, because I look, I look at trucking, I looked at trucking and in the military as parallels, you know, there, there were two parallel lines on two different sides of 
you know, our society, you know, the military being the government. And then you got the, you got truck drivers who are the civilian, but we're doing the same thing in many aspects. You know, we, we are individuals within the industry, but we're serving a greater picture than what any of us truly realize. And, and I was, I mean, I don't, I think that as a veteran, I think that in veteran, other veterans who serve as truck drivers understand that to a greater magnitude, if that makes sense. You know, th- no, that makes perfect sense, James. You know, one of the things, uh, you know, just that being a, a, you know, a service member, a former service member, you know, one of the things that, that I attribute to, even to the job that I'm doing for, you know, right now is the, the, um, the point of accountability, um, you know, yes. especially as a, as a truck driver, you know, getting something delivered to point A to point B is a big part of that. You know, so, you know, so I, I, I definitely understand and agree with that assessment of just sort of how uh, the, the trucking industry and the military share several parallels, you know, so, um, you know, and, and from that, you, you, you know, you're, you you get back into trucking, uh, you found, you found your calling, you found your, you know, your, your source, yes. you know, um, and in 2017, you, um, you started, uh, I think you, you started driving for prime, correct? I did. Okay. Uh, and, and just, uh, j- can you just talk about that experience and just some of the things yeah. and accolades you, that you, that you had had with, with prime? Um, well, I started, I started kind of getting back into social media to see who, what company was going to be best for me. And I, I settled on prime because they're based out of Missouri, which is where I live. And, and they also offered a training program. So and it, it, because I'd had kind of a lapse in my CDL prior, obviously I went and got the training. I went and and from day one, when I stepped on campus at prime, it, they were amazing. They made me feel welcome. They, I could tell, I got a sense of that camaraderie that I had been missing from the military, from the, from my service time. And, and I went, you know, kind of fast forward, I went through their training program. I got, um, obviously got into my own truck and was, le- you know, I turned into a lease operator and then I was nominated um, by uh, my by prime and my dispatch as a rookie veteran driver, military driver of the year, or a fastport for that system there uh, for that group that um, organization. And going through that process was further eye opening. You know, there were other veterans in in the industry, and we were sharing stories and going through that stuff. And then at that point in time, they had and and I didn't win. It, I didn't win that competition. I got to like the semifinals, um, and the individual that won it was very very deserving of it because the award was uh, a, I think at the time it was like a 2017 T six eighty brand new truck. Just it uh, it was an amazing amazing opportunity, amazing blessing. Um, and then Prime had said, hey, you know what? Typically we let drivers go, you know, a year, however long before we let them get in the training, but we realize the value of your military background and the position or the rank you held in the military. We want, we'd like you to become a trainer. So, so I started training and I felt, I felt honored for that because I was like, man, I don't, I told him, I said, I don't want to circumvent your system. Your system's been working. They said, Nope, Nope. We want to give you this opportunity. So they did. And, and I felt even more fulfilled because I was doing once again, what I was doing in the military as a, as a senior NCO, as a staff sergeant, I was training privates. Somebody or that individual decided to give me the opportunity to teach them what I knew and we're operating 80,000 pounds of equipment, which is, you know, I call them ICBMs on wheels going down the road, you know, and it f- further created a fulfillment within me. Well, I started training one of the guys that I had served with, one of my sergeants, uh, EE5, uh, his name's Toby. And he wanted to, he came into the trucking industry and came to prime and he wanted me to train him. I started training him. Well, I got a phone call. Oh gosh. It had to be about three or four months after the fast port um, deal in mats in 2017. And it was from Shannon Courier from St. Christopher's fund. And she told me I had been nominated uh, from somebody at fast port. I didn't know at the time, um, but I had been nominated to their program, which was through a progressive commercial insurance program. Uh, um, and, and then St. Christopher's uh, for, for a truck giveaway, which to this date has been the only time they ever did it. And I'm the only one they've ever done it for on the commercial truck side. So how, I mean, what, what was it like uh, working for that particular charity? I mean, I mean, th- I mean, working with oh, that charity. Working with them? Oh, it's been, it's great. Great. I mean, they are a great bunch of people. Every one of them. I mean, they, um, me and Shannon stay in contact to this day and she's been amazing. You know, it's, and, it's, and it's through that work. 
uh, you know, you 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 were nominated uh, for the tr- uh, Frontline Hero. Yes. You were recognized for that. Um, having done all this and coming from the background that 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 you're coming um, that you're coming from, what what's your advice for you know, veterans out there who are you know struggling to find a, a career? You know, what advice would you give them to to you know to have a to, to take a stab at? A, a trucking career. The best advice I, I'll tell you the advice I give all veterans that reach out to me um, is that despite what you may feel, there is a place for you here in this country. There is a place uh, for us to still lead and lead by example. And the trucking industry is one of the best places to do that. Just because we can understand the magnitude of the job that we perform, we can understand that the magnitude so to the extent that it's just like serving in the military to where we're going down the road and nobody knows what we're hauling, where we're hauling it to, while we're hauling it. They just know that we're going down the road and it doesn't affect their day. Not one bit. And it's no different than when we're serving in the military to it. Nobody knows our mission. Nobody knows why we're doing our mission. Nobody knows our own personal reasons for doing that mission. Other and what it does is it allows the everyday average civilian to just, live their life, go home and sleep safe and warm. And as truck drivers, we do the same thing to an extent to where we are hauling everything that's in their life except air. And they know no different. They know no different. You know, even, even through the pandemic, I think it was proven more proof positive that just the vital importance of we do what we do every day. So you guys can go home and sleep. You know, James, I, I feel like I can, I can talk to you for, for a very long time, but I know you're a very busy man. You got things to do, but, but, but before we leave and this being veterans day, yes, sir. you know, other than, other than the, the, the free food and the free drinks that we get on this particular day, mm-hmm. um, uh, on, on a serious note, um, you know, w- what does this day mean for you, you know, being, you served for 11 years. You, you served in Afghanistan. What does this day mean for you and, and your fellow servicemen? For me, it means a day of remembrance. And it, it's a day of remembrance of why I'm here. And it's also a reminder of why I continue to give back because I do have brothers and sisters that did cash that check. And I do what I do in their memory. I do what I do in their honor in order to allow life to continue. Um, I'm a big supporter of my country. I'm a big supporter of those that I've served with, those that continue to serve, um, those that have served before me and paved the way. It's all about giving back. You know, I remember and joy. Obviously, there are sad memories, but I rejoice. Their lives are to be celebrated. This country and its journey is to be celebrated and because we have come so far. And that's, that's what Veterans Day means to me is to celebrate those lives and what they sacrificed in order for us to be here. We've been speaking with James Rogers, owner of Spartan Direct. James, it is a pleasure having you on. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's been an honor. This episode is provided by DMC Insurance. DMC is a specialized underwriter of trucking insurance, providing world-class risk engineering and claim solutions. DMC is committed to delivering the best insurance experience and results in the business. Learn more at dmcinsurance.com. Welcome back to Road Signs and our special Veterans Day episode. For our next story, we'll look back towards the Second World War in Vietnam and a supply line called the Red Ball Express. The Red Ball Express was a supply convoy during World War II. The name came from the term red ball that referred to perishable items that were prioritized for delivery to prevent spoilage. Any transport with the red ball designation was considered high importance. As the Allied forces fought and advanced across Europe, food and medical supplies lagged behind, leaving American troops vulnerable. So to ensure that the troops had everything they needed, the Red Ball Express was created. During the war, a convoy stretched as much as 140 trucks strong, driving as much as 400 miles to reach Allied troops and often without headlights to elude enemy forces. By the time the program ended in November 1944, more than 400,000 tons of various items, such as gasoline, ammunition, oil, food, and other supplies had been delivered to the Red Bull Express. This experience was also glamorized by Hollywood with the release of the 1952 film Red Bull Express, 
During the Vietnam War in 1965, the Red Bull Express was established again to expedite repair parts and transport equipment on deadline, while providing auto technician support during the war effort. During this battle, the mission and objectives varied from the original supply line. However, it was a vital conduit for the military in the supply chain. To teach us more about that experience, as well as his time as an Army Vietnam veteran, we welcome Transport Topics Calibrate columnist John Baxter. Welcome to Road Science, John. Thank you, Michael. How are you doing today? I am doing great this Veterans Day. Before we get started, I want to thank you for your service. Well, I appreciate the mention. Uh, we spend time in both Virginia and Mississippi, and in both states, if you wear a veteran's hat, you get thanked a lot. Even beautiful women will walk up to you and give you a hug. So <laughs> it's uh, it's worth wearing the hat, and it's really great to uh, have people recognize what we what we did. Not a problem at all. You know, one of the things, I mean, as I explained about, about the Red Bull Express, and since having you here, you know, as, as a living history of it, what was your specific role in the supply chain in, in Vietnam? Okay, good question. I was in uh, something called the First Logistical Command. We were based in Chu Lai, Vietnam, which was a big base on the coast, home of the AmeriCal Division of the Army. It was actually uh, Colin Powell's division. He was the executive officer, and his office was right across the road from our motor pool. Uh, our job was to feed m most of the parts of the division. There was another brigade down south of us, uh, which we did not feed, but we fed much of the division in July. And my job, there was a, a unit called the 196th Light Infantry Brigade north of us uh, on a base called LZ or Landing Zone Balding. Hill 63, and my job was to maintain the refrigeration trailers, refrigerated trailers that hold uh, their refrigerated food up Highway 1 to Landing Zone Balding, LZ Balding as we call it. And uh, the units, reaver units were not like what you have today on most trucks. They actually had little gasoline engines in order to make the job of maintaining the, uh, the engines themselves simpler. And uh, my job was try to, to try to keep these engines running I was a reefer mechanic by training, and fortunately, maybe even incredibly, the, uh, the refrigeration was pretty reliable, in spite of the very rough roads that we were driving on most of the time. But the gasoline engines, um, the critical thing there, the engines would last fairly well if you got the oil changed and filters and so on, but uh, the problem was that the ignition parts, especially in a tropical climate, would tend to deteriorate after a while. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but the military parts system ends up being a barter economy. And depending on where you are in the chain, you have a lot of trouble getting the parts. You were mentioning the roads. Um, and, and, you know, being in, you know, that particular country at that time of, of war, um, could, could you just talk about just kind of how the, the, the danger in, in, in driving that? I mean, it's not like, you know, driving a highway, but. I mean, it's. I mean, there. There's quite a bit of danger there. Can you can you speak to that? There was there was some danger. Fortunately, the sector we were in was more or less pacified, not entirely, but it was more peaceful by the time I was there. Now, a year, a year and a half before I got to July, it was a little more rugged. But the Marines were there, the Army was there, and it was much better. But what we would experience was mines in the road. Fortunately, uh, I guess explosives in 1968 were not anything like they are now in, in third world countries, and so the mines were not terribly, terribly potent. But we rode in our cabs with sandbags on the floor to protect us and with black jackets and weapons in case of a, an attack on a convoy. Uh, the big issue was uh, the potential for mines. Mostly the Viet Cong seemed to be interested in ruining the equipment, and so they would wait until the tandem axles, drive axles of the tractor were over the mine and then blow it up. And mostly you'd see trucks towed in with bent up wheels and this kind of thing. I suspect that they might have also damaged rear axles, but I never heard of anybody being seriously injured or killed. But we were very fortunate. It wasn't like that everywhere. A lot of times convoys would be attacked, trucks set on fire and all kinds of really difficult, difficult situations. The problem for us mostly was that the road it was actually, Highway 1 was the road from Saigon to Hanoi, Saigon now Ho Chi Minh City, and um, it was just rocks. Uh, it was drivable, you weren't stuck in the mud, but we had to go about 25 miles an hour to keep from breaking everything on the truck. 
very hard on the tires and, of course, very hard on all the equipment because of the up and down vibration. So, John, you know, those are some incredible experiences. Um, what are some of the moments that stood out for you while, while serving on that particular uh, supply chain line? Well, that's a good question. We um, support troops in a, on a base like where I was were pretty safe. But the kind of thing that hits you is when you come down, we, we had um, we had a motor pool and then short distance down the road, we had like a yard. Well, it was a yard, a, a, what we call it, a class one yard, had a warehouse and there was room behind it for the reefers park. Um, after I'd been there a couple of weeks, they put me on night duty for a while uh, because the guys would have trouble starting the reefers once they'd loaded them up. And uh, I went down there one morning uh, when I'd been switched over to day duty and saw a rocket hole, a crater in the, in the yard and was just lucky that I hadn't, uh, hadn't been there working the night before. Uh, I don't think that rocket killed anybody, but that's, it's an interesting, uh, life as a support troop. Your level of, of, uh, fear and, and, uh, you know, concern, uh, level of chances of getting killed or injured were like 1% of what they were out on the field, but things could happen. And so you always had this haunting feeling that, uh, you know, you could be dead or you could make it home. You just didn't know which was going to happen. Although our chances were pretty good. And we had it so much better than the guys who are actually out in the field that I do not complain about, about our situation. Uh, there are many inter interesting things that developed in Vietnam. Uh, while I was working on the reefers, of course, I've always loved trucks and I paid a lot of attention to what was going on with the trucks. And one of the issues that we had, uh, transportation officers, I'm not sure how they were trained. They probably knew a lot about how to manage uh, a convoy in case of an attack. They knew that you had to put uh, sandbags on the floor of the cab and this kind of thing. But they weren't very well trained in uh, cooling system technology. And so we'd get a new truck and uh, the uh, lieutenant who was in charge of I guess that aspect of the motor pool would tell the guys to drain the coolant out of the engine, which probably had uh, frozen corrosion inhibitors in it, maybe even a mix of antifreeze and water to raise the boiling point, and put plain water in. So, of course, right away you're starting out on the wrong foot with a dirty cooling system. And then the other aspect of it was that, of course, on the rough roads, uh, the radiators and the hose connections, this kind of thing, were vulnerable. And uh, guys would end up with leaks, and they'd start to get a rise in temperature and uh, have to shut, shut her down for a minute. Well, we were very fortunate in a way because where we were in Vietnam, Vietnam is the rice bowl of Asia. And uh, everywhere that we traveled, there were rice paddies right around. So, of course, when your radiator got low on coolant, you would just turn your helmet upside down, dip it into the rice paddy, bring her back and pour it into the radiator. So, of course, this water was not particularly clean. All I can say is I, w I never saw a truck overheat. I think the radiators were designed for 120 plus degrees for desert warfare. And in a tropical climate, it's hot, but it's the humidity. And the temperature would normally be probably in the upper 90s. So they would never overheat. But, uh, you know, the cooling systems were not in real good shape. And I'm pretty sure that had an effect on the on the durability engines because there must have been deposits all over the cylinder liners and this kind of thing. That moment that you were pointing out, you know, very equipment and maintenance heavy. And as I've known you and being a columnist of, of our magazine, Calibrate, you know, which, which covers equipment and maintenance uh, quite a bit, you know, that's a, that's a good way to follow up to this, to this next question. You know, as you have told me, you know, previously, you know, after your time at, in, at Vietnam, you had gone to engineering school and the, you know, your career path ha has, has morphed into one of auto technology and just being a, a veteran and a Vietnam veteran and being in that particular situation um, of this particular supply line, how do you relate some of the issues that you've dealt with in, in, in Vietnam and in the service in general with what's going on right now with equipment and maintenance and, and even to the, the supply chain issues that we're, that, that we're facing right now? Yeah, interesting question. Uh, I think it does apply. Uh, not so much to the availability of drivers and stuff, but what occurs to me, uh, we had a lot of trouble getting parts, and uh, undoubtedly because of COVID, as it affected uh, manufacturing and then the entire uh, logistical chain of getting parts out to warehouses, uh, when people can't come to work because they have COVID or they're, uh, you know, they thinned out the 
to the numbers of people working in order to keep uh, six feet apart, and all these factors, uh, even things like technicians uh, not going to classes to catch up with the latest equipment. Uh, between the parts availability and possibly, you know, technicians not working as many hours, not going to school, I assume that all these things adding up to, um, you know, much harder to get parts, much harder to fix trucks means occasional, or at least occasional shortages of vehicles to haul all those containers around. That, that's what I would see. Partly a lack of uh, education among the, you know, you know, the newest technology among the techs and also even a lot of shortages of parts. It's got to be slowing down the, uh, the supply chain. And we had similar problems in Vietnam. Do you want me to talk for a minute about Red Bull? Yes. Yeah, the, it's interesting. That was kind of the exception to the rule. But uh, we did have it, as you mentioned. And the, the theory of it was that you could do without parts and often limp along. I spent most of my year, I think, cleaning and gapping spark plugs. If you did that and you adjusted the carburetor, you could get, get these engines running even when the spark wasn't real good. Occasionally, I'd get coils uh, and replace them. They were the most vulnerable other part other than the plugs because of the heat. Eventually, the insulation would break down, and then you'd have a situation where the engine would run for an hour or two and then quit because the coils would get hot and the insulation would fail. Um, but what Red Ball did, the way it worked was, if you had a, a unit that would not run at all, you know, if it run out of oil and the bearings were spun or something like that, uh, the engine had seized up, then you could order an engine or another part, an integral part, via Red Bull. And we could occasionally get, you know, we had total failures and we could get parts. And the Red Ball worked. The, the, Rest of the system didn't quite, you know, it was like trickle down. You're lucky if it trickles down as far as where you are. But the Red Ball system really worked. And if you had a unit that would not run and you could replace, you know, a major component, they would send it to you. It would take three or four days, I guess, but that was nothing short of a miracle. So it, it did work for us, and we were very glad that, that we had it. Well, you know, just in speaking about that, um, is, it, um, is there – certain uh supply chains or or just certain processes that that you've seen th throughout your, your your life that resembles the the red ball express that you experienced in vietnam i mean is there i mean it could be small or big well i think that anything that we you know today we're everything's like red ball fedex ups overnighting things uh just works very very well and uh but that's the way i would describe it uh, the, the, the guy who uh, developed the, the business plan for you, uh, not UPS, because UPS was a little, little more, uh, you know, three, four days, and they still do a lot of that. But the guy who changed the world with FedEx was a real genius, and that's that's what Red Ball was. The idea was you get it there directly. There's no delay. It doesn't go spend its time sitting in warehouses or getting loaded and reloaded. It's uh, you know, just full blast makes one trip on an airplane and it's there the next day. So that that would be I what I would say would be the closest thing to Red Bull, what, what they were trying to do with Red Bull. So uh, just kind of putting your analyst hat on, as I do with most of my guests here on Road Signs, what was the solution in Vietnam that you would think, I mean, being in this supply chain, being in that process, what, I guess, advice would you have or what method would you like to see in supply chain issues right now that you would think that they will help remedy the situation? Well, that's a very good question. But what I always felt, uh, it was like they wanted to save money, but they didn't want to, want to win the war. And I always thought that when you send a new engine or a new reefer unit uh, out to the field, that what you should do is to package with it not only all the manuals, but also uh, maybe a year's supply of parts so that uh, you wouldn't be trying to order stuff, you know, within a month or two at a time that you got the equipment. And I just wonder if something like that these days, uh, shipping a new tractor with some filters for it, uh, you know, fuel and oil filters and coolant filters and things that go right away, uh, belts, you know, perishable items, uh, that would be a possibility. Get the factories to procure the parts and include them in a box sitting on the seat or whatever. You know, John, um, before I let you go, I just want to ask you, since this is a special day for veterans, 
And as a veteran, uh, could you just uh, let me and the, the other other uh, viewers know, you know, what does Veterans Day mean to you? Now, that's a good question. Uh, this kind of thing used to hit me. I used to march in a Memorial Day parade in Wayne, Pennsylvania every year. You don't live there anymore, so I can't do it. But uh, uh, I did have a period of time in the mid-80s when I had a lot of stress from the war. Uh, luckily, it didn't bother me very much, except in the middle of the night, I'd have trouble sleeping. Uh, it's ultimately a kind of sur survivor guilt. Uh, these days, I've mellowed out quite a bit, and I think in another dir direction. And I realized that, of course, um, uh, those who seriously injured, who were seriously injured or died, made enormous sacrifices. The rest of us became very sensitive to those sacrifices. But the bottom line is that all those sacrifices probably helped to make the world a better place. So I've sort of gone from being very saddened by Veterans Day to being, I wouldn't say elated, but uh, having a positive feeling about it. And the thing that makes me sad is that um, most of the country probably doesn't realize how uh, acutely we felt uh, pain after the war, uh, recognizing those sacrifices, but how significantly uh, those sacrifices very likely have improved the world. If you look at Vietnam today, I'm an optimist, I know, but it sure looks to me like it's a much better country than it would have been if we had just let the communists come south and take it over with no resistance. So um, I, I try to think in a positive way, and I do find that there's a, a great benefit to be achieved when you serve the country and fight uh, people who are really uh, poorly, how can I say it, misinformed, I have, have a warped attitude about life, not cruel, and uh, you counter that with something that's much closer to justice. Very well put, John. Um, and again, thank you for your service and the, the time that you had spent uh, serving in Vietnam. Uh, you know, I, From the bottom of my heart, I, I, I truly appreciate it. And I'm sure others do as well. This episode is provided by DMC Insurance. DMC is a specialized underwriter of trucking insurance, providing world-class risk engineering and claim solutions. DMC is committed to delivering the best insurance experience and results in the business. Learn more at dmcinsurance.com. Before we close, let's take a moment to revisit our original question. How have our guests' military service shaped their experience in the trucking industry? First, a big thank you to James Rogers and John Baxter for joining us on this special episode. And also, a big thank you to those who served in our country's military. Our military veterans have played an instrumental role in how the trucking industry has fared in the ups and downs of our economy. Although there's no shortage of the gratitude we have for our fellow service members, we also wanted to share the journey that they've had during and after their time in the military. As we heard from Rogers, the road was tough, but it was the lessons learned from his time in the Army that got him through and led to a successful trucking career. And as we heard from Baxter, the lessons learned from the supply chain lines in the trails of a foreign land are applied to the supply chain issues we have today. We thank both men and the other veterans that are listening today for their service to our nation. If you enjoyed this episode of Road Signs, please let others know. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If my questions have sparked questions of your own, Share them with the Road Signs team or reach me on Twitter at Michael V. Freeze. You can email us at share at ttnews.com. We'll read them and respond daily. And of course, we'll be back in two weeks with a new episode of Road Signs. Until then, I'm Navy Electrician's Mate, Petty Officer, Third Class, Michael Freeze. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>